You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us once again. If this is your first time, please make yourself comfortable as we bring you Answers for the Family. Each week, this show will address issues such as family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, lasting health, and so much more. Now, having over 30 years' experience working with families in crisis, I am grateful to have met and worked with some of the top professionals and many people in the helping fields and skilled authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. Now, you all can do me a big favor. Please check out some of our past shows at AnswersForTheFamily.com to hear some informative and entertaining guests as well as dynamic co-hosts as they discuss ways for you and your loved ones to become happier, healthier, and more at peace. Now, I'm also looking for some show ambassadors who will forward at least one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. I want you to know that I truly appreciate it and it's just another way that we can make a positive difference in the lives of others. Now, I can tell you that in this particular uh, um, show that there are some statistics out there that really suggest that we all know somebody uh, who has been incarcerated. We all know somebody um, who either has made some bad choices, and, and that's why our topic is going to be When I Got Out, because it's also the title of our guest's new book. Now, once in a while, a novel comes around that profoundly touches on a topic that is both tragic, socially taboo, and at the same time, it gets as real as it can get. Now, unfortunately, uh, a little known and disturbing fact is that the United States is the world leader in incarceration, with 2.2 million people currently in the nation's prisons and jails. That's a 500% increase over the last 40 years. Now, according to a study entitled Demographic Patterns of Cumulative Arrest prevalence by ages 18 to 23, nearly one in three African Americans have been arrested at least once by the age of 23. By the age of 28 to 33, about 20 percent of men with at least a high school diploma but less than a bachelor's degree hold some kind of criminal conviction or guilty plea. Imagine being one of those young people who through a series of bad choices finds themselves convicted and imprisoned for being an accessory or in some way involved in a very serious crime. Now, fast forward many years to the day of your release and imagine what would you do when you get out? Now, to discuss this and more, our guest, Peter Seth, is a writer living in Los Angeles. He was born in Brooklyn and raised on Long Island. He wrote and directed the award-winning short film, Lunch with Louie, which I remember, uh, which, which appeared in more than 35 festivals around the world. When I Got Out is his second novel. His first, What It Was Like, has been praised by readers all over the country. And you don't have to take my word for it. Check out the five-star reviews on Amazon.com and the high rating on Goodreads.com. Peter, welcome to Answers for the Family. Great to be here, Alan. It is good to have you. Um, And as I was reading the book, one of the things that struck me was the fact that I feel like I'm being um, I'm being entertained, and I and I choose novels like yours because I want to be entertained or I want to escape. But I also felt a little bit educated because I was also learning things that that I think a lot of people don't know. And so uh, I really appreciate the fact that it was obvious that you did a lot of research to to nail it the way that you did. Well, thank you, Alan. I do appreciate that. I do, uh, do research before I start my novels. I like my novels to be based in some reality before I create a uh, a dramatic, entertaining story for, for the reader. That's great. Now, I mentioned a few statistics in the introduction, but before we talk about the book, share some of the information that you found during your research that surprised you. Well, I was really, I mean, everyone knows prison life is bad, 
but I was really surprised to find how grueling it is, and especially how, how hard it is for people released from prison. The statistics are just uh, frightening. The uh, uh, homelessness is 10 times the average rate, uh, uh, unemployment, food insecurity. Everything that's hard in this world is harder for an ex-con. So from there, I started to uh, develop a story of, uh, of hope and redemption for my character, Larry. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned that about how difficult it is. Um, I, I want to put a plug out there also for uh, um, a friend of mine that has a company called Do Good Works. And what's beautiful about that is, is that they hire the unhirable. And they have found that uh, there are some incredible people out there that uh, have done their time and have had an incredibly difficult time finding any type of job. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, uh, uh, most uh, employers are, are uh, you know, um, hesitant to hire someone. Mm-hmm. No matter if, and, and I believe in redemption and forgiveness and that people can change their lives, but a lot of people are, you know, are not. So it just makes it harder for the ex-con. Sure. Uh, now, again, it, you know, I, I mentioned some statistics oh. and such you know, in the very beginning, uh, which, one of which was there's been a 500% increase over the last 40 years. Now, do you believe that that implementation of uh, of in, in, an increase of these people, do you believe that uh, part of that is contributed by having corporately owned prisons? Uh, do you think that they've contributed to this drastic increase uh, in the amount of people that are now being incarcerated in the United States? Well, well, I think the privatization of prisons is more a result of the amount, massive amounts of money that government was putting into incarceration. There was a lot of money to be made there. In, in fact, the, there are only 8% of uh, American prisoners in private prisons now. But that's a lot of money. That's a, uh, that's still, that's a, yeah. that's a lot of money. It's a big uh, pool to draw and dip into. I think that uh, from what I've read, private prisons are good for the profits, but not good for the prisoners. Yeah, you know, my concern would just be that, you know, if, if you're corporately owned, what is your motivation to make sure that they don't come back in? Right. And, you know, there's, and there is a, a terrible revolving door uh, problem with, you know, prisons and going out into the street and not being able to find a job and having no way but to find your old ways. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very difficult uh, road and a dramatic road. Well, speaking of dramatic... Um, uh, I think the way in which you wrote your character, Larry, uh, was incredible. Thanks a lot. You know, and, and one of the thoughts was, was that you, you wrote from first person, which I think, uh, at least from my reading it, you know, felt like you are, you are kind of feeling what it is that Larry's going through, and especially in using the self-talk as well. Um, you really felt like... Um, you know, you're going through some of the same stages that he was going through. What was your decision that made you decide that, okay, I'm going to write this first person? Well, I, I love the first person uh, novel. You get deep into a character and you go through what a character goes through in adventures and places you would never go to personally, but they appeal to you emotionally and, uh, and, and find, and find the, the, a passion between the character and the reader. So, and again, I just mentioned Larry. So for those that are watching or listening, so Larry is the, is the protagonist in, uh, you know, in When I Got Out. Um, and he spent his entire old adult life behind bars. Uh, when he finally gets released, he's in his 60s. How has his world changed? His world has changed plenty. He, he uh, we know how hard modern life is. Can you imagine if you, he, he doesn't know how to operate an ATM or a phone he doesn't know how people talk to each other these days, how the uh, relationships between the sexes is, it's not the same as it was 40 years ago. So he has to, he comes as a, really as a stranger in a strange land and sort of has to find his way in, in an America uh, that's unfamiliar to him. And that gave me a great opportunity as a novelist to, you know, to uh, you know, ha- have fun and drama with his situation. Yeah, and... I got that, you know, the the um, the fish out of water theme, you know, that, you know, and, and it's one of the things that I like in movies, you know, that concept, you know, I'm, I'm the person that if, if somebody's visiting from another country, I want to be the one to take them to Disneyland because I want to see that, you know, the way in which they respond to things that they've never seen or never done. 
and I, I get that same feeling as as Larry is is running into things that he couldn't imagine. And he's trying not to make the same mistakes that put him in jail in the first place. But he has extra complications. Uh, the lawyer who had the money left to him by his parents has disappeared. So should he go after the lawyer who's stolen from him or, you know, stay, stay close to the strict rules of parole? So he has extra dramatic pressures on him. Now, um, were you inspired by any any particular real world events? Um, you know, what what would some of those be? Well, it's funny. Real world events, not so much uh, uh, as any particular murderer, but I was very aware because uh, Larry's murder was he was a famous murderer. He was the Ivy League killer as a teenage mur- uh, murderer in the first book. What it was like. So when he comes out, he's extremely wary of uh, of of being so famous. He doesn't want to be a famous killer anymore. But in the world of social media, that's not so easy. So he's exposed in ways he doesn't want to be and forces him to take uh, actions that uh, some might some might consider self-sabotage. Others would consider dramatic. <laughs> well, and, and again, and, and we're not giving anything away. No, no, because, no, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, and, and, and I've, I've tried to be very careful as mm. far as with my questions because I don't want to give anything away because that's what made it so engaging, um, you know, was that, you know, there there are some books that you know you feel like okay, I'm I'm learning something, um, you know, and it's you know more of like a textbook type of thing, but you know this was more you know more like a you know a, a TV series in which when you finish that chapter, it's like finishing an episode, but I want to binge watch now, you know. <laughs> well, I want to make it my I want my books to be entertaining and fun for the reader, even as you're going through uh, dramatic ex- uh, experiences with Larry. It's a, it's a good ride. It's a good read, and uh, I had you know fun writing it uh, tr- and trying to make it deep and, and entertaining. Mm-hmm. I think life is that. I want to tr- I want to try to get as close to, to life as I can. So, and speaking of how close you got, uh, how close did you get with your research to be able to get the information that you got? And with both books, because your first one was based on being in, mm-hmm. you know. So now getting out. Um, Tell us a little bit about the research it takes for a writer to to gain this, because now we can kind of look at this a little differently for those people out there that, you know, that um, are in school, they want to be a writer and things like that. How deep do you got to go to write something like this? Well, thank goodness for the Internet. The Internet (laughs) is a problem with some things, but for some things it's great. So whereas I used to have to spend my time in libraries, now I can just search I buy books. There's some wonderful books out there. You need a combination of things. There's periodicals, but there are wonderful websites and wonderful uh, organizations out there who are uh, specifically trying to help parolees and ex-cons. But almost <laughs> there's, there's information out there for anything you want to write about. It just It's just out there. Go for it. Great. I like that. Now, um, based on the research that you assembled, um, let me give you a magic wand. Okay, so you have a magic wand, and you can make changes in the penal system. Um, what would some changes you would make? Well, the first, if you want to change the penal system, change the school systems first. If you have good public schools, I think we'd have few, fewer criminals. People have better lives, they'd have better standards set for them, and they wouldn't wind up in prison. But that's another story. In terms of prison... Uh, I think that has to be a real change of uh, away from pure punishment to rehabilitation. Uh, there are just too many prisoners in prison, and they are going to come out into, into society. And what kind of people do we want returned? We want, do we want damaged people, or do we want people who are worthy of a second chance? And I, I've read so many uh, uh, you know, uh, accounts of prisoners' lives. These are men who are genuinely sorry of what they did and they want a better life and I think we can help them it's you know we just have to drive around the streets of LA to see all the homeless a lot of those are ex-cons see and that's a great point too because you brought up okay one of the things that you do is you start working on the public school system which like you said is a whole nother thing and and I am right there with you on that Um, I'm glad you brought up the the uh, connection to homelessness you know we now over the last 10 years you know, we've seen an explosion in homelessness. And and what you're saying is is that a lot of those are 
former prisoners. And so if you want to help you know, decrease homelessness, let's decrease the amount of people that we're imprisoning. And if we want to imprison fewer people, you're saying, let's start at the school level. That would that would be best. That would help all of society. It would help us all. But yeah, so the the statistics on homelessness and uh, ex cons are, are horrible. They're ten times more likely to be homeless. Uh, they're thir- if it's if it's a, if they're multiple uh, uh, offenders, they're thirteen times more likely to be homeless. In terms of uh, of uh, finding an apartment, uh, landlords don't want to rent. Uh, sure. So they so they wind up in uh, in motels, or they wind up in single room occupancy places, or they wind up homeless, and uh, it's not good for for society. Um, so, again, with the magic wand, what would be some other things that uh, that that you would see being able to do? Um, because I know that as as I was doing some of my research for this, and you know, uh, you know, there are people that are setting up social enterprises and stuff because you know if you employ them you know now they have a much better chance of being able to find a place to live which means they're not on the street if they're not on the street there's less of a chance of committing another crime i know the salvation army is very good yes and i think service master is another company that, that employs people who've been in trouble uh i think that's wonderful work and it's uh you know it helps everybody yeah no i i, I couldn't agree more I think it's great. Life is hard out there. Yeah. Now, you touched on something in the book, and again, without we're not giving away right. too much, but um, something that I would have never have thought about, but dating after prison. Oh, my. You know. You dating, know. dating anytime. <laughs> da- that's what I was going to say. Okay, <laughs> dating anytime is tough enough, um, but, you know, I, I, I like things sometimes when I'm, when I'm going through and I'm reading it and I go, I never thought of that. You know, so talk a little bit about what Larry well, goes up. through, you well, know, with the uh, the concept of dating after prison. You know, how honest or, you know, it's, you know, there, there, there there's some interesting things that you touch on, but share a little well, bit about well, Absolutely. It was Larry. very important to Larry. Larry went into, into jail because he got involved in an obsessive teenage romance. So he's very susceptible uh, to women. <laughs> and he comes out and he wants to, of course, you know, Redeem his life and 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 you know sort of uh, you know e- you know expunge his guilt as much as possible. But he also wants life and love and tries to find it, and it's not easy. Uh, part of it is uh, his whole past is in prison. He can't make small talk. Everything he knows is from prison, so he can't really. He has to find it difficult. He finds it difficult to make normal small talk. So. Uh, he has a long way to go, but I, I'll, I'll do one spoiler. He does find love. I, I left him in such a bad state after the first book. I had to, uh, I owed him some happiness. Um, and you, you know, again, sort of, you know, it's kind of both books, but, you know, his, his crime started uh, as a teenager, and as you said, it was sort of tied to love. Mm-hmm. Um, Share a little bit about where you kind of got those ideas based on thinking about things the way a teenager would think about it. Because as as I was learning about Larry, um, I'm realizing that that you as a writer are at one point are having to think like a teenager, and now you're having to think like a sixty year old forty years later. But the same guy. But, <laughs> but the same but, guy. But forty years later. Yeah. Yes. The, the, well, the first book that. That was a book I had in my mind for a long time because I think everyone was in an obsessive teenage romance that was destructive. It didn't all lead to double murder, but all of us, you know, had some terrible heartbreak when we were a teenager. Right. And so that's why I wrote the first book. Then when I decided to write a sequel, even though the second book stands alone, I thought, uh, what, you know, what, what can I do to, uh, to show how this, this man is aged and... And uh, and how he's still dealing with the same demons, so uh, I you know I just just fell in in love with the idea of uh, of of showing a, a whole lifespan from the begin at the beginning and at the end. And when you talk about dealing with his demons, um, you you sort of set it up. It, it's sort of like he he put up barriers. You know, how did you decide where you were going to break down barriers? of where he would choose to open up and where he wouldn't. 
that's part of the drama of his story. Right. Because he has he has uh, struggles, uh, emotional struggles. He's the legal struggle trying to get his money back from his uh, his crooked lawyer. But he also has the the day to day struggles of uh, of just trying to get through life and and as a normal person, he wants to be normal. He wants to be anonymous. But uh, he sort of denied both those things by the drama of his story, which is interesting because you know if if society wouldn't have evolved into what it did as far as being able to Google everything. Mm -hmm. um, so the mindset that he has going in would seem like you could come out and kind of blend in. But it's a whole different thing. And it, 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 it was very interesting to me that if you don't know that all of this has happened, you might go, you know, go out thinking that, you know, hey, I've moved to some little town and people don't know who I am and, and everything is fine. But the way that you wrote it was that wasn't possible. Yeah. He, uh, uh, finally, he thinks everyone knows who he is and it, it, it makes it Im impossible for him to live a normal life. But he struggles for, for uh, normality and I have to say through, you know, through the love of a good woman, <laughs> he, he finds his way through, and he has, through a lot of mistakes and... Uh, and missteps, he you know he 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 finds his happiness. Yeah, there was a, a correlation. So, do you think that you say starting over in prison is anything like starting over after a divorce or the death of a spouse? Or well, it's it's more serious. But a lot of people in their sixties are having to find uh, a new way uh, to live. It's as you say, after a divorce or an illness, or you you lose your job, or you get transferred, and you have to just pick yourself up and 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 find a new way to uh, to uh, maybe even improve your life. You could even have a better second life. Well, and, and that's a great point because I was that's kind of where I was going with is is that in this day and age of people starting to learn more about mindfulness and things that that they're figuring out how do I how do I take this negative in my life. And turn it into something that is positive. How can I, you know, go from, let's say, a divorce situation or whatever, and look at it and say, okay, maybe this was meant to be. Maybe I'm supposed to end up with somebody else. Maybe this is supposed to happen. And um, tying that to something like prison seems incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> that's what makes, it's what makes it more dramatic. Exactly. But I, be, I believe that, that people can uh, change and improve themselves. There's, uh, I know on your show you have lots of, uh, of, of experts who can, who've studied uh, human behavior, and there are techniques and ways of, uh, of living better and relating better. I have friends who were in bad first marriages, and they found a way to make a good second marriage, and uh, and and you you can work on yourself. I think we we all should. It, yeah, you know, we only have one life. Let's make it the best we can. <laughs> all right, um, we are talking with Peter Seth. Uh, we are talking about his new book, When I Got Out. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Founded over thirty years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family, and uh, we are talking with Peter Seth. We're talking about his new book, When I Got Out. Um, 
one of the things that's great about this show is is that we get listener questions and and I love the fact that people take the time to send in some questions ahead of time and I want you to know for everybody out there we truly appreciate it I know a lot of people have to work in the middle of the day so we get feedback where people will say look I'm a teacher or I'm in a job to where I can't um, you know call in but I'd love to ask some questions so if you go on the website and and you subscribe we will send you information about who's going to be on. You can send us questions ahead of time. We can ask those questions. And then however you listen, if it's iTunes or Stitcher or SoundCloud or iHeart, uh, there's so many of them. However you listen, you can then go later on and listen to the show, and you'll still be able to hear your answer. So, again, I want to thank the people that do that. Um, now, uh, this uh, this question reads, uh, it says, um, Uh, Growing up in one of the worst communities in Chicago, I'm one of the lucky ones as I made it out to a better life. Looking back at my childhood and the friends uh, who, like family, uh, few of them uh, have been so fortunate. Uh, Some are struggling to survive and some have done things that ended up in, uh, they ended up in jail. Okay, before I buy your book, I have a question. Uh, I see that it it appears to talk a lot about the challenges, uh, but does it also give people hope? And this is from um, Alicia in Illinois. Thank you, Alicia, for your question. Uh, yes, the uh, uh, the uh, fate of an ex-con is very difficult. My book is uh, portrays it in its reality, but my book is filled with hope. I I. I got very attached to, to, <laughs> to Larry, Larry. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, give him a dramatic ride, but I wanted to uh, show that, that, you know, life can go on, life can get better, no matter what you've done, and no matter what has been done to you. But uh, I really believe in, uh, in, in human redemption and, and, and the possibilities of human growth, and uh, so I put it all into Larry. Um, you know... Uh, one of the things that you touched on, and again, I don't think we're giving anything away, but talk a little bit about some of the coping mechanisms and resources, uh, you know, that that you gave Larry. That when people real, read it, realize that it was really kind of meant for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Larry has a tough time. He uh, he he does get a job coming out of prison, which is quite unusual. Uh, but it's a job in the gig economy, and he's a tough time. Uh, getting by, he he lives paycheck to paycheck like a lot of uh, uh, like a lot of us, uh, and and str- and is very shy because of his past. He doesn't want to be known. He he doesn't go back to his hometown. He goes to a totally different you know part of the New York area, yeah. uh, but he's still hungry for human love and human contact. He's I think Larry was basically a good person who made uh, some very bad decisions, but there's still goodness in his heart. And uh, he, he tries to get back in touch with it. Yeah, and, and yeah, you mentioned that you know he moved to a different area. Um, you know, from some of the research that I did, that's incredibly common. Yes, you know that uh, that people will in in the more severe crimes. You know, so when people have been a long time, um, I noticed that I was looking at some percentages, and they said there's a great deal of them that that go away. But doesn't that then also kind of make it more difficult on one hand because you don't have any support system? Yeah, totally right, Alan. And it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because if you go back to your old neighborhood, you could fall in with the same gangs and the same criminals that got you in trouble in the first place. If you go where you know where you don't know anyone, you don't have any support. So uh, some some very difficult choices. Uh, you know whatever you know whatever you do. You have a difficult yeah. choice, but I, I say I, I've I've read so many uh, accounts of, of these men and women's lives, and they're fighters. They want they they want and they 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 can be damaged. They don't have the advantages that most people have, but they're trying to fight for a good life. Mm-hmm. Well, we have another comment that came in, and this one reads: My friend is a former judge who works with a nonprofit in our state reforming uh, uh, juvenile legislation. Their intent is to change the current practice of kids who are being incarcerated for minor infractions uh, instead of using other techniques to deal with the problem. Your novel is centered around a young man making bad decisions. 
you know, I believe the story has a great deal of relevance uh, to so many of our youth today. I love your novels. Uh, uh, look, uh, and it looks like this uh, is something that I want to read and to forward to others. And this is from Avery in Texas. That's terrific. Thank you, Avery. Yeah, and um, it's interesting this one comes from Texas because I know that um, because I, with my other job, I work in different states, and and Texas is still one of the states that uh, you can still get the death penalty as a minor. Oh, yes, the, Texas, <laughs> Texas is strict. That's for sure. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there are lots, uh, lots of uh, restrict. Some of the states are very, very hard on uh, on their prisoners. Uh, some states, like California, are trying to do something about it because it's just a huge. Uh, you know, it's a drain on, on the treasury, and it's a drain on society. We have better things to do with people than lock them up. I know they feel that way. Yeah, and, and I agree. You know what? We're going to take another little break, but we will be right back. So everybody stay with us. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Hello, I'm Marty Cove. You might remember me from roles such as Sensei in the Karate Kid films. I've done over 100 films and countless stunts in my career, and I've always given 100%. With the damage done to my body over time, I needed to find relief from my chronic pain. My passion for health and fitness drove me to find a natural way to combat muscle pain. Teaming up with doctors, detectives, and a compounding pharmacist, we've created Marty's Cobra Cove Ultra Strength CBD Cream. It's the only thing that has been strong enough to knock out my pain. And fast. Honestly. You may have tried the rest, but it's time to try the best. It's legal, it's safe, and 100% effective. Show your pain. No mercy. Go to www.martyscobracove.com. <laughs> All right, uh, and thank you, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that was nice as, as we were sitting here for those that uh, couldn't hear. So Peter's going, oh, yeah, that's Marty Cove, the Karate Kid. <laughs> Cobra Kai. <guy. laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, um, but yeah, and I think that's, you know, we were talking a little bit about the laws. Um, did you do much research in the laws? Because obviously you have your character is in New York. Yes. Okay. But, yeah. you know, did, so did you just research the, the laws in New York and say, this is what I'm going to do? Or did you research different states and say, ah, I'm going to put him in New York? Well, I did my New York research. And the other information I found out is subsequent, really, to writing the, writing the book. I just got, you know, just very interested in, in the subject. It's a, it's a compelling subject. These are, you know, you know, these are human beings who are, uh, you know, in, in, in very difficult, situ- difficult situations. And it's... Uh, you know, it, it's a you know, it's a situ- it's a, a topic that concerns all of us. Really, it's a it's a nationwide problem. So, um, a lot of what 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 the book talks about again for those, and again, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's it's really about reinventing oneself. You know, is that in this case, it's a drastic situation, but I think it's something that we all go through at some point in time in life where we are reinventing ourselves. Uh, if you had to reinvent yourself, where would you start? Oh my God! I'd probably be uh, a few inches taller. <laughs> it, it, oh my goodness, that is a frightening thought. I mean, it would put right back in my face. What would I do? I would. Uh, I don't know. Go to medical school and try to be a doctor. I'm kind of late for that, but I would do something to help people. Mm-hmm. That's there's nothing like helping people. Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. Much better now. There we go. Um, all right. Um, so now that now that Larry's out there, now that you've written the book, do you do you go back over it and think, um, what are some other things I I might have done to reinvent Larry? Well, every yeah. Uh, as, there's a famous quote from a French poet. Paul Valery said, uh, a work of art is never finished, just abandoned. So, you know, at one point I had to turn in the book, but I st- still I come across things say, wow, I should have put that in. Oh, that would have been great. You can't, I'm still so involved with it, but, you know, the, the, you know, the, the book is as it is. But 
you know, I think of, yeah, I could have done that. Oh, that would have been a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever I read another, another good writer, I say, oh, I, sh I could have stolen that. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. I, I stole what I stole and, and kept the rest for myself. Now, uh, what, is, what is next for you? I, I'm working on a play. I, I love theater, and these books, they took a lot out of me. I love, I love writing them, but it was, a, it was a lot of work. And, and I, my best friend's an actor, and I've been promised promising to write him a play and uh, I used to write plays long ago and and this is a lot of fun and it's, it's something that someone can uh, can get in one evening my my books are long and take a uh, take a while to read but you know, a play is, in, is an immediate it's in you know one sitting so I'm going to try that great and uh, share a little bit about your uh, your movie oh okay well I did uh, long ago with the same friend of mine we did a short called lunch with Louie and it was Tremendous amount of fun to do. Uh, we got a lot of success with it. We did film festivals. We even uh, I mean I mean I even sold it. I mean I made some money on it. It's 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 run all over the world because there's only one line of dialogue in it, so it's mainly silent. Uh, but it's uh, it's on my website. It's on YouTube, and uh, I thought I'd get uh, you know some money to make a feature, but that sort of never happened. You know how that is <laughs> with uh, film finance. You yes, know it is. exactly. But, um, yeah, I do it again. Well, I mean, to talk a little bit about because you mentioned and and I've been racking my brain trying to figure out which festival I saw it in, okay? Oh. Because because I was uh, there was a period of time in which I went to a lot of fe festivals. I've been to I've been to Cannes twice, and I've been to right. a lot of other um, festivals all over the country. And so I was racking my brain because I saw it, and I went, "Oh, I've seen that." And then I started thinking about it, and I went. I don't remember which festival I was. I was at. lucky. I had great success with Lunch with Louis. It was at the oh the AFI Festival, That's Breckenridge, Manhattan Short Festivals, festivals in Europe. It won. It won. I was lucky. It won awards in Europe. Oh, I can't. I used to know more, but there were thirty five. I kept. I just kept sending it out, and people kept saying yes. So hey, it was great. Yeah. So and then as soon as you said that, it was probably AFI because that's the be one honest. I've been to I, oh, the most. I was so lucky. It was the it got first showed at the Chinese Theater. I couldn't oh. have, I couldn't have been happier. Couldn't have been. Happier. It was a it was a great night. I love it. So um, the play. Are you able to? Are you at a stage to where you can share a little bit? Can you give a little teaser? Because then ideally. The best thing to do then is if we can tease them a little bit, yeah. we can bring you back when it comes time and tell them where it's going to be playing well, and where they can see it. Well, it's funny. It's it's about a father and daughter. I have a wonderful daughter, and uh, it's a complex relationship. Uh, so I thought I could write a good father-daughter uh, play, and uh, it's a ways away, but. Yeah, I'm having fun with it. And, uh, I hope she doesn't hate me for it. <laughs> I promise. So, I promise you, Daisy, it'll be fine. <laughs> well, um, maybe we need to have her in. When it, when it... <laughs> no, 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 no. no. When, you, you should be so lucky to have my daughter in. She's a doll. No, She's no, a doll. no what I was saying is, so when it when it comes time for it to be released. Would love to have you back, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> but let's have both of you because then let's have her be able to point out oh, the things and, and get her two oh, two cents worth. That would in be fun. Oh, and my stuff. Yes, no, I I'm lucky. I have a wonderful son and wonderful daughter, and uh, that would. That's great. Hey, doesn't get much better than that. Yes, family is key. Family uh -huh. is key when it comes down to it. Uh, you know, uh, that's you know. And people live all different kinds of lives. I know lots of single people. I know people with no children. Uh, there's lots of ways to be happy. But I know for myself, I get great joy from uh, you know, my family. That's great. In this, in this unsettled, uh, unfriendly world, people need, you need love. Yep. And it's, and it's my belief it's, it's actually uh, it's a lot friendlier if people turn off the news. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're so right, Alan. It's like, it's a push pull. I, you know, I, I can't turn things off. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm an information junkie. I love to learn, but sometimes it just, uh, it just, you know, makes you so upset. You can't sleep at night. It's like, uh, you know, life is tough enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my latest rule now because I also feel that I, I need to I need to stay up on what's going on. So I try to listen to things that um, it's so hard to find something that doesn't have a slant. So I'll listen to things that slant each way. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, and 
as soon as somebody goes into something that I believe is is either completely inaccurate or just propaganda, um, I turn it off. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we try to tell people here is is that um, you know just as soon as you as soon as you feel that that's what's going on, turn it off and and switch to something that is positive, that is uplifting. There are more shows, and if people will start giving their ears and eyeballs to things like that, eventually the advertisers will figure out that we have to go where the eyeballs are. I totally agree with you. On the internet, the d- delete button is so it's the best button you can use sometimes. Exactly. You don't have to, uh, you know, uh, you know, endure all all you know, all, all the the junk that's coming your way. You can be selective, and, and there's and things. There is wonderful stuff out there if you are selective. There's, you know, the you know, and the resources of the world are more available to us than ever before. And we, you know, uh, we have a friend who's in Argentina. We were just texting with our friend in Argentina. She's riding horses in Argentina. What's wrong with that? Yeah, you know? and they send you pictures back, right? Everything. Yeah. It's, you know, so, you know, so you know, move towards the positive, you know, run towards the light. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, um, and for everybody out there, again, the book is, is When I Got Out, um, and, and it's written in first person. So let's kind of go over the same question that we just went over, but um, what would Larry say about the situation right now? What would Larry say about what, from what he's learned and, and where he has gotten himself to what would Larry say about life right now and, and how to get the best things out of it? Well, it's sort of frightening for Larry. When he, he went into jail at, ni- at 1970, so the Vietnam War was going on, civil rights uh, battles were still being fought, the feminist uh, movement was starting. So it was a time of, of, of some political turmoil. But when he comes out now, he finds things are in a way worse. People are angrier. Uh, there's just more tension all around society. So there's a lot for him to deal with. So he has to try to find a way to navigate through an unfriendly, strange world to him. But he tries to reach for sort of you know what he knows and what he strives for, which is human contact and human warmth. It's interesting. I, as you were saying that, the thought that came through my mind was, was that he went in in sort of the infancy of some of those things, um, and he came out, and they were on steroids. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, you know, I'm not a young guy. I've seen a lot. I've, I've, we've seen some changes, yeah. and, and some for the better, some not for the better. But uh, you know, I think Amer- Americans are basically optimistic, and we, we want to improve things. And uh, I think we, we'll, you know, we we'll just keep fighting for our country. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. We, what choice have we? Yes. What choice have we? So, Al, for those people that either want to, if they want to watch the short film, if they want to get more information about you or about the books, what's the best way for them to do that? I have a website, peterseth.com. I have a, I have a lot of blogs on there, uh, material about my books. I, I have lunch with Louie. And uh, anything else I can think to, to put up that uh, would amuse readers and amuse me. I put stuff on my website just because I want to keep track of it so I can keep all my good... Uh, you know, my YouTube uh, is in one place, but I, you can search the blog and find lots of good stuff on there. That's great. Well, first, I just want to acknowledge you for really putting out a book that, as I said, it, it's, it's both entertaining and educational at the same time. And what I like, it, it made me think. That's you know, and that's you know that's. I want people to think and feel and, yeah. and have a good time too. I mean, yeah. a, a book is a great uh, a, a great escape. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and when you say had a good time, it was amazing to me that that Larry could find humor. Oh, uh, you know, in in what would seem like, I mean, for most of us, anybody that you, you've written something in first person that allows us to put ourselves in that position. But then when we think of it, or at least for me, when I think of it, and I'm putting myself in that position, it's like, wow. And and I'm I find myself rooting for Larry. Great. But also. Um, when when he finds humor in things, I you know and to me I'm like, wow, you're a better person than me because <laughs> well, you know. I think you have to find humor. I imagine if I were in prison for a long time, I would, I don't know how, but I'd find some ways to laugh, and I think that uh, that we all have to you know uh, 
laugh a little to get through life. So I wanted to make Larry a, a, you know, a good companion for the reader so that you're, you're, you're rooting for him and you, you see his problems and you see his... But he's, he's human. I want to say he, he's a real guy. I mean, yeah. he's a real person to me. So, uh, so he has, so he, he, he has to crack jokes to, uh, you know, to keep himself going because, uh, you know, life is tough and we need to, we need a lot. We need all laughs. Sure. Sure. It's somebody that made a huge, uh, huge poor guy. mistake in the beginning of his life. Yes. And which some people do and most people find a way to avoid, but I, I had a, I had to have a dramatic story. But I think a lot of what he goes through are, are very, are very universal uh, problems, and you, and looking for universal solutions. I mean, we're, you know, uh, we all sort of want the same thing. You know, uh, we're not all that different. We all want, you know, love and support, and you know, just not too much, but just enough. So I try to have Larry, uh, you know, find it. And, you know, he's a tough road. He 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 goes through lots of changes, but. Um, I think he's a human universal story. Yeah, and I think so too. Now, um, there was a lot of decisions, and probably before you wrote the first book, a lot of decisions about um, who he would be, and you know there. And and again, I, I don't want us to seem like we're making it seem like one person just made one mistake, and mm. then they're still a great person or something no. like that. Um, but you you chose to go with somebody who made one huge mistake. Um, it doesn't take away from the fact that we realize there are bad people, and there are bad people that that that's all they do, you know. You, you know, and and everything is based on how can I exploit someone else in any way possible. Um, I I think I know the answer, but what was your reasoning for deciding that I'm not going to go with that kind of prisoner? Yes, I I he he was at different levels of of guilt as I went yeah. through different uh, drafts of the book. But uh, I sort of wanted him to be where he is. Uh, he's sort of an accomplice uh, yeah. to murder. I, uh, you know, he 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 falls in love too hard and makes some bad choices. But he's a, he's basically a good person. The problem, as you say, is lots of people in prison are bad and have to stay there. And it's uh, we do need our, we do need prisons. There are sure. bad, violent people who need to be locked up. The problem is filtering out the people who really could use a second chance and shouldn't be wasting their entire lives in prison. It's in, that's where professional pen, uh, penologists and criminologists come in. But it's, it's a problem for all of us because uh, there's just, you know, too many people involved. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for writing it. Um, and uh, I'll be looking forward to the play. <laughs> Thanks, so, Alan. Um, but again, so again, thank you so much. Great. Thanks a lot, Alan. All right, now, and for everybody out there, please be sure to put on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we will be joined by Aaron Thompson and Rob Danson to discuss Food on Foot, Working Together to End Homelessness. Uh, so see, we're still going to be talking about ending homelessness. One way is is to try to keep prisoners from having to end up homeless, but there's so many other ways to do it. Um, so please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com, or you can subscribe to the show through iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Vimeo, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio. And I have to write all that down because I can't remember. <laughs> we keep getting new ones. But it's great. I, I love this medium. I love the fact that we're able to, to sign on and to reach more people this way. Uh, and if you like what you hear, please leave a review on whichever one you listen. Um, I want you to know that it helps us reach more people. We greatly appreciate it. And the next time that you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page, stop by Peter's page, um, and check out some of the latest posts. If you like them, please like us. Continue to spread the word. And uh, in the meantime, for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio.